Today I'm going to talk about virtue signaling and dog worship, narcissism, the rise of dog worship in our society. <laughs> There's just so much I want to talk about in this video. It is such a broad topic. I could just go on forever talking about this, but I will try to keep it concise and just present a few things that we can discuss in the comments. Now, dog worship is just a symptom of a much bigger problem, of, of, of a profound sickness in our society. And uh, that's what I want to talk about here. Now, before I talk about virtue signaling, I think it's important to discuss narcissism a little, just to help you understand dog lovers, or as I like to call them, dog worshippers, a little better. You know, I've talked about narcissism in previous videos. Uh, I mean, these people call themselves dog lovers, but when you really look at their behaviors, you, you see that they don't love their dogs. They leave their dog, which is a pack animal, alone for hours on end uh, while they go to work, which drives the dog literally crazy. They treat their dogs like human beings, which is driving the dog crazy. Uh, and they're having to medicate their dogs with psychopharmaceuticals just because the dogs are going mental. Uh, there's so many examples of this. They let their dogs roam freely, uh, putting their dogs at risk of being hit by vehicles or eaten by wolves in the case of where I live. Uh, they drive around with their dog in the back of their pickup truck. They don't care if a rock hits their dog. Just think about what a pebble does to your windshield. They don't care about their dog. They drive around with their dogs unrestrained within their vehicles, which is very dangerous for their dogs. I mean, I could go on and on. They mutilate their dog's reproductive organs. They deprive their dogs of their natural behaviors. They bring them to obedience schools so that they won't behave like dogs. The point is they don't love their dogs, but they worship them. And this is a, it's a mental disorder. Uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of it. We have established that these dog worshippers display many narcissistic traits. I've learned this through discussions with viewers and friends who have had and continue to have relationships with narcissists. And uh, I have watched a number of YouTube videos and I've read a lot about narcissism and I've learned a lot and I have come to the conclusion that... Uh, you know, these dog worshippers are very narcissistic. So when I first started making YouTube videos, I was astonished and shocked by the seething, hostile, irrational responses I was getting from viewers. It was as if my words were flying right over their heads as though they were not hearing me. They were responding to me as if they didn't hear the things I'd said. Their arguments were completely illogical. I felt frustrated because it was like they were not hearing the things I was saying and it was just, uh, it, it was driving me crazy for a while. And it is only through watching videos on certain YouTube channels that are uh, about narcissism that I came to understand these people a lot better. And I, I realized that the miscommunication is not between me and them. It's within their own minds. There are no words you can say. You can't explain things enough or in a, in a way that is sufficient to get through to the mind of a narcissist uh, because they're not right mentally. So you have to quit trying to explain to them. It, it, you won't get through to them. Anyway, um, a couple of the YouTube channels that were very helpful in enlightening me and helping me to understand these people a lot better, include Surviving Narcissism, a great channel, uh, as well as this one by Angie Atkinson. Now, if you find yourself feeling frustrated in your dealings with dog worshippers, I highly recommend checking out a few of these videos, uh, and uh, yeah, it'll help you understand them better. I'm going to let you listen to a little bit of what Angie Atkinson says about virtue signaling, which is a topic I'm trying to get to today. Uh, and uh, yeah, she'll explain what it is. 
So really quickly, what narcissists do is they use virtue signaling and grandstanding to fool you into thinking they're decent people. What am I talking about? Well, let's begin with a couple of quick definitions. First, virtue signaling. Officially, virtue signaling can be defined as the conspicuous expression of moral values. So basically, this is where the narcissist will tell stories or little tales about their own untouchable virtues, and they will claim to have certain values that they totally stick to all the time. But in reality, they don't have those values. And in fact, those might actually be the opposite of whatever values they're kind of living by at this point. But the reason that they pretend to have the values is because it makes you see them in a better light, the best light possible. Does that make sense? Now the term virtue signaling was first used by a journalist, and you know I love me some journalists, but it was used to describe any behavior that could be used to signal virtue. So Angie, as well as many other YouTubers, talk about how narcissists use virtue signaling to gain status, to gain favor, to gain respect. Uh, and this is something dog worshippers do all the time, whether they are aware of it or not. It's like, look at me. I'm such a great person. I am so patient, so kind, so loving, so much better than you, so much better than others. I am morally superior because of blah, 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 blah. You will also find a lot of YouTubers and articles online talking about how we are living in a, in a society that has grown increasingly narcissistic. Narcissism is an epidemic in our society today. Narcissism is a, uh, is a, is a psychological disease which, which has become a cultural uh, epidemic, especially in, uh, in, with the emergence of postmodernism. Because we, we have grown up in the age where life is really about me. We were almost conditioned to become and be very narcissistic. When I was, uh, when I was a young boy, my parents said, sweetheart, you should do whatever's going to make you happy. And my teachers at school, when they, we spoke about, well, you know, what are you going to do? It was always, well, what, you know, what do you, what do you want? There was, I was never told that you're part of a bigger context, a bigger process that might need something from you. So why are we as a society becoming so narcissistic? Well, I've linked you to this article. I've read many articles, but they all essentially say the same thing. Uh, this article here says that childhood abuse and neglect may be possible factors involved. I clicked on that possible factors. It brings me to this study. It states that while narcissistic personality disorder remains a severe and fairly rare clinically diagnosed condition, subclinical narcissism or narcissistic traits, and that's what we're talking about here with dog worshippers, have reached epidemic proportions with serious consequences. Ever-increasing levels of greed, self-obsession, superficial relationships, arrogance, and vanity are everywhere apparent and not making us any happier, with common mental health problems on the increase, especially among the young. Seemingly irreversible alterations to family life, I've talked about how marriage has become disposable now, uh, technological development, including social media, attitudes to death and dying, and celebrity worship, all feature in the rise of our narcissistic society and our interconnected trends. Group greed and grandiosity have led to wide-scale corruption. You know, they're just talking about how there are a lot more people now with these narcissistic traits and that it is having a very severe and negative impact on our society. Perhaps most sinister of all is our attitude to the planet that supports us as we play a part in the destruction of much of the environment and many of the species that share the earth with us. I've talked about this in my video called The Nature Crisis, What Are You Doing About It? Uh, looking at the literature of narcissism, the aim of this paper is to consider ways in which cultural changes have brought about this huge rise in both individual and group egotism. We are seeing many more clients high on the narcissistic spectrum. Now, I wanted to read more. Uh, I wanted to uh, read this paper in its entirety, but I would have to spend 44 US dollars to learn about how our culture has become so greedy. Isn't that funny? But anyway, getting back to the main article. 
They've labeled narcissism a modern epidemic, pointing to the rapid change in society that occurred in industrial and post-industrial times as the cause. There have been so many changes. They mention the self-esteem movement, where educators and parents started telling their children how special and unique they are to make them feel more confident. Parents tried to confer self-esteem upon their children rather than letting them achieve it themselves through hard work. They talk about the rise of individualism and how the community and the family are no longer able to provide the same support for individuals as they once did. And uh, they talk about just the breaking down of families, the social fabric deteriorating. Uh, and how modernization of society prizes fame, wealth, and celebrity above all else. And this creates an empty self shorn of social meaning. People have no more meaning in their lives. The rise in technology uh, and, and, and the social networking sites like Facebook and Instagram that have become hugely popular, people are becoming addicted to these sites. They are addicted to them. And addiction to these sites is strongly linked to narcissistic behavior and low self-esteem. So what can we do about it? They mention medication and therapy, but maybe it's time to take a break from the smartphone, shut off your computer, meet up with a real friend, connect on a real level with real people, and just turn off social media for a while. I'm doing next to nothing on Facebook anymore and I feel a lot better for it. In that study I referred to earlier, that paper you have to pay $44 to read, they say that having compassion for oneself and recognizing how ordinary we really are make for a good start. You know, I think it's okay to be individualistic and to pursue your own passions and do what makes you happy, but you have to remember that you're just an ordinary person and you're part of a collective and your behaviors affect your community and you have to have respect and empathy for those you live with in your community and, you know, don't be an asshole. And so anyway, getting back to virtue signaling, uh, I have been reading a lot about this and I found myself once again on the Reddit dog free website, which I mention often. And by the way, they're almost at 20,000 members, which is pretty awesome. We are not alone. There are a lot of dog rationalists out there, more and more coming out of the woodwork every day, more people opening their eyes every day to see dogs for what they are. Anyway, I found someone's post. They, they wrote, why is every dog now a rescue? Years ago, you never heard the term rescue dog, but now every dog is a rescue. Rescue dog, my rescue dog. I'm so sick of hearing that. And they're saying, yes, it's such pathetic, look at me, virtue signaling to the extreme. You know, you see them put these bumper stickers on their cars, who rescued who? Oh, it gives you a license to be an asshole for the rest of your life. Yes. People used to say, we got a dog at the pound. Now it's, we adopted a rescue. Woohoo, look at you. Oh, aren't you special? Rescue is if I find an abandoned, possibly injured animal, spend my time and money on rehabilitation, and decide to keep it as a pet. All these ass clowns are doing is adopting, but they have this hero martyr complex. That's exactly right. Because these people feel empty inside, their lives are devoid of meaning and true connections, they want to feel special. So that's why they have this hero martyr complex. You know, you're not saving a dog from disaster or certain death when you go to the animal shelter and give them money and purchase a dog. You're not rescue. you're not being a hero, you're not saving someone from a burning building or anything. You're just putting down your money. But these people want to feel special because they are sick, because they're really damaged and mentally ill. They're not right in the head. They're looking for praise because deep down they feel worthless. And this is unique to dog owners. You don't see cat owners doing this. You know, when someone asks where you got a cat, you say, I bought her with my debit card at the SPCA. Like how often do you hear people talk about rescue cats? I mean, I don't hear it very much. I might hear it sometimes, but not as often. But these 
dog worshipers, man. I'm telling you, it's a mental illness. The whole rescue thing is virtue signaling. And it needs to be called out for what it is. These people need to be told, you're sick. Getting a dog is not the answer. It's not going to heal you. It's not going to cure your mental illness. It's not going to give you any real sense of purpose or connection or meaning. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg, only the Band-Aid has been pulled out of the trash. It's somebody else's garbage. It's soiled. It's covered in traces of piss and shit and saliva and capnocytophaga bacteria and parasitic eggs and God knows what else. Anyway, I'm going to share something with you that I found on Facebook. This is a monument to the mental illness I am talking about, this whole virtue signaling, you'll find examples of this everywhere. You do not have to look far. It's all over social media. But this one really stood out and uh, I wanted to share this with you. Someone wrote, my Facebook friend shared this and I literally spit out my wine. So many think they have a real reason to give up their pet. Think again. And here we're going to see a perfect example of that hero martyr complex I mentioned. You know how people are always rehoming dogs for literally anything they do? Well, next time you want to get rid of your dog, recall this story and photo. I will show you the photo a bit later, but let's just read. Frank is an angry pooter. Now, here we go with the dog cult and their own language that they have. This is something that you see with cults. They have their own lingo, their own language, and this is the language of the dog cult, people. Apparently... Pooter means shitter. So, yeah. Frank is an angry pooter. Things he has pooted on when mad at me. Pillow, bed, couch, shoes, literally a pack of crackers, inside my purse, in my suitcase, and on top of a makeup bag. His aim is remarkable for a dog that takes multiple tries to jump on the couch and often falls off while licking his own butthole. And he knows how to really hurt you, like pooting in your single pair of running shoes when he knows that you will blindly reach for them because you, a complete and total adult, always leave your shoes in the same spot, thus ensuring maximum damage as you endure skin to poot contact. I seriously spent 10 minutes scrubbing my duty hand. I'm assuming duty is dog cult language for dirty. But that's what these mentally ill weirdos do. They make up their own language. They create their own words to mask how utterly disgusting these creatures are and how horrible their behaviors are. Instead of calling it what it is, shit, they make up a cutesy sounding word to make it sound oh so cute and so benign and so adorable even. I seriously spent 10 minutes scrubbing my duty hand and crying, both about the duty, what is duty, the dirty, the mess, what the fuck, and the ruined shoes, and the fact that this fat fuck of a dog has been tormenting me for seven years, but I still love him, and I'll probably spend the next seven years finding and cleaning up his angry poots, because I I picked that asshole out of a whole litter and made him a part of our family. And you can't unfamily someone just because they poot in your shoe. Well, I've got news for you. A dog is not part of your family. It is an animal that is no different from a rat. It is a disgusting scavenger animal that poses a risk to your health to the health of your family, to the health and safety of your family, of the public, of the entire community you live in. And by taking a dog into your home, you are putting your family and your entire community in danger. And you're risking the spread of zoonotic diseases to them, noise pollution that can drive them insane and ruin their health. I mean, it is totally irresponsible to own a dog. It is the opposite of what they think it is. They think it makes them morally superior. 
You know, a friend of mine who has narcissists in her family told me that they have everything backwards. Instead of feeling sorry for the victim when there is a crime committed, they will actually feel bad for the perpetrator. Uh, they got everything backwards. Instead of being a good person here, you are a shitty person for endangering the entire society you live in. The rest of this post really made me want to vomit. Frank does not have feelings. Uh, I mean, he doesn't even know what the hell you're talking about. Super sexy? You're, t you're calling your dog sexy? What is wrong with you? Are you having sex with your dog? Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if you are. Um, you know, pug mom? No, your pug had a mom, and it wasn't you. It was another deformed, mutated creature that was struggling to breathe because humans have bred it to not have a properly functioning respiratory system and a face that's so squished in it can't even breathe properly and it's struggling to sleep it has to probably sleep sitting up i mean watch my video about the cruelty and insanity of breeding pedigree dogs But uh, here's the picture. Isn't that lovely? I'm telling you, anybody who puts up with this nonsense is not right in the head. Anybody with any dignity or self-esteem would not tolerate the presence of a creature in their home that does this. You know, when you have children, they're only in a stage where they wear diapers for a short time. They outgrow that and after a couple of years, they can use a toilet. Dogs will never achieve that. You're stuck doing this for seven more years? What is wrong with you? You're sick. Nobody with any self-respect would put up with that. They would get rid of that thing fast. And talking about this hero martyr complex, you're also going to see this a lot when it comes to people who want to own dogs that are deformed or crippled. This seems to be all the rage now. I made a video about that dog that had a freaking tail growing out of its forehead. And people were lining up, you know, to buy it or to, I was going to say adopt it, but you don't adopt dogs because you can only adopt children. Adopt is a word that is reserved for humans, human children. Anyway, uh, it seems like the more mutated uh, and hideous and disfigured a creature is, the more crazy people go and the more they line up and show up in droves to, uh, you know, bring it home with them. They, they, they want it more than anything. If it's messed up somehow and looks horrible, the uglier it looks, the more in demand it is with these dog worshippers. Now, what does that say? That they are a great person for having so much love that they would, you know, take on the responsibility of caring for it. You know, look at me. I'm so great. I choose to take care of this creature when nobody else would. Other people would reject it. Other people would call it ugly, but not me. Uh-uh. I'm special. I'm so kind. I am so virtuous. Oh, sing my praises and kiss my ass because I am a better person than they are. And I am a much better person than you if you think this dog is ugly. Or I'm such a better person than you if you think it's okay to get rid of a dog because it's shitting all over your house, pissing all over your house, destroying your property, driving you crazy with barking, driving you crazy with behavioral problems that require hours every day to try to train out of your dog. You know, oh, you don't have the time to t take care of your dog. You don't have the time to train your dog. Well, I have the time to train my dog, even if it means taking time away from my children. Oh, it doesn't matter because I'm such a great person. I will invest that time in my dog. Not like you, you cold-hearted bitch. Oh, you're such a monster. Not like me. Oh, that is all that is going on here. I mean, look at these pictures. Nobody in their right mind thinks that this creature is beautiful. Gorgeous? Are you kidding me? You're mental. You're virtue signaling. And that's all it is.
I was never told that maybe you have an obligation to help those who are less fortunate than you. So narcissism is, 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 a, is a culturally conditioned epidemic of, of literally pathological self-concern. And so the experience of the narcissist, which is very common for most, many people or most people from my generation, our children, is we think about me all the time. We are always thinking about what we like, what we don't like, what we want, what we don't want. And so um, our, our own egos and the fears and desires of our own egos become the narrative of our, of our relationship to life. It makes us unknowingly inherently selfish because we're always thinking about me and we're always thinking about what's going to be good for me and what am I going to get out of any particular situation. It cultivates a very materialistic relationship to life, even with relationship to people. How is this going to be good for me? And when, when you awaken beyond this, this, this extremely narcissistic uh, 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 merry-go-round, when you, when you awaken beyond it, when you see beyond it, experience yourself beyond it, it literally is like coming out of a prison. It's important.